I think before um, I uh, talk about the topic today, let me introduce the company which I'm working right now. I'm actually working in Chrome Malaysia, which I think uh, some of students may have heard about it before. We are also one of the international accounting firm in Malaysia. And this Mr. Lee Kokwai is our managing partner. Uh, in detail, I'm not going to talk about it, okay? Uh, what we are doing at the moment is uh, we actually offer audit, tax, corporate advisory, risk consulting and management consulting, and also outsourcing services. Those are the services we are offering to our client at the moment. And of course, we also interact with our various government agency, which is already listed here. And these are our managing board of members. There are altogether six of them. We are already almost uh, 40 years okay, uh, up to today, and we have more than 10,000 clients. Yeah. Uh, in fact, our one of our founder partner, Mr. Punyo Ho, actually uh, started his practice way back to 1983, okay, uh, until today. So, in the past, actually, he um, after 1983, he formed up the company. He merged with his uh, brother-in-law, Mr. Mong, uh, in 1989, uh, 88, uh, become uh, Mong and Poon those days. So quite a number of clients, if they can remember, they, are, they used to call us Mong and Poon. And after that, we I think we joined the affiliate uh, com uh, Crow Global uh, in 1994, okay, as you can see from the slide here. And of course, and, uh, we are gradually growing uh, up to today and we have our Crow Epo at the moment. But of course, we also work together with other outstation office, which they may not be the same owner, but they are the um, uh, same under the same company, but uh, just a different offices, okay? As you can see from here, uh, other than the managing board of partners, we also have the uh, head of division for various division, like for example, audit tax, corporate advisory, and so on. And these are our corporate value. We care, we share, we invest, and we grow. And altogether, we have 13 offices up to today, and we are the auditor for 104 listed companies in Malaysia. We have more than 1,002 employees. And Today, we are the fifth largest accounting firm in Malaysia. And this is a Crow Global Network, uh, I, which I'm not going to share about it, uh, in detail. And in, in let's say talk about services in, uh, just now I have mentioned, uh, we offer audit tax and so on. And these are the detailed services we are offering at the moment. So you can see from here, from the moment you want to form a company until uh, you have a group, you want to reorganize the company, we also can provide the services to assist for those groups to uh, move to another level. Okay, so um, without further ado, uh, let me go into the topics today, capital allowance. And this is myself, of course, it doesn't look like the picture. <laughs> and uh, just maybe uh, briefly introduce about myself. I graduated from UTM Johor from Management Accounting. Then I further my master degree in UKM, Bangi. Um, after that, in way back to 2012, I continued my study PhD in uh, UST Malaya. And I graduated in 2018. Okay. And on top of this, I also um, managed to complete my ACCA and my CFP. Okay. Um, wait for a moment. Okay. As you can see from here, basically from accounting, usually when we, um, how we recognize the fixed asset, we usually recognize the cost of fixed asset. And at the same time, we also need to recognize the depreciation because the value of the fixed asset will be uh, deteriorate um, along the year when we use it. Because when the asset is new, the value is higher. When the asset is getting older, the value is not there. So we have to recognize the depreciation accordingly so that we can we know the fair value of the fixed asset. But for tax purpose, we usually disregard the depreciation. Okay, because the depreciation rate may not be same with our under the tax regulation. 
So whenever when we prepare the test competition, we will just disregard division and we will try to check whether this asset can be qualified as qualifying expenditure. Just to let you know, for those big assets, um, auditor or um, the company recognized in the accounting, it may not be a, qual and qualify a qualifying asset okay, for tax purpose. So we need to check through the tax regulation and see whether this is fall under the qualifying capital expenditure category. And yes, then only we can claim the capital allowance. Of course, the rate for CA purpose is quite different from depreciation. Okay, let's move on. Okay, you can see from this slide, there are a lot of allowance. There are different, different type of allowances, which I'm not going to go to talk about all today. I will just focus on capital allowance today. As you can see, capital allowance may include a plant and machinery, furniture, fittings, vehicles, and so on. And you can also refer to the relevant public ruling, which I already stated here. If you want to know more about the details, how to claim the capital allowance. These are only partially of it, I would say, because um, there are a lot of uh, gray area under capital allowance, even until today. Although the public ruling is trying to give you uh, the explanation and also some example to guide the taxpayer to know more uh, about capital allowance and how to claim about it. And other than this, uh, these are other allowance. You can take a look if you have time. Let's take a look on the criteria. And this is very important if you want to claim capital allowance. Other than you check whether this is fall under the qualifying capital expenditure, you can only claim capital allowance if, can, if you can meet all the criteria. Firstly, it must be carry on a business, which means an individual, if you are not carry on business, you are only an employee. Unfortunately, you can't claim any capital allowance on the asset you own. Unless you are uh, have a sole proprietor which you carry certain type of business activity, then for those fixed assets, if they are qualified for CA purpose, then you can claim CA. Okay? And you must prove to the authority you incur for it. And the asset is used for the business purpose at the end of basic period. If, let's say you dispose of within uh, the basic period, then you may lose your entitlement to claim for capital allowance. And finally, you must be the owner of the asset at the end of the basic period. Okay. When we talk about the date for the qualifying expenditure is incurred, it's quite different from uh, the normal accounting standard. Because when you can claim capital allowance um, is when the asset is being used for business purpose. Why we say so? Let's say you purchase uh, this um, office equipment in 2022, but you actually put aside the office equipment, you are not going to use it, but you are going to put in use this big, uh, office equipment in 2023. So when is the date you can claim for capital allowance? Is only 2023 when you start to put in use. Not when you incur, then you can straight away to uh, claim capital allowance. Because uh, for tax, we have to adopt the deemed incur uh, principle, which means you can only deem incur it when you put in use the qualifying expenditure. Okay? And the capital allowance is computed on the overall cost okay, of the plant machinery, although the payment is not made yet. This is more um, top, related to higher purchase. Okay? As you can see from here, basically for capital allowance, there are two types of allowance under the capital allowance. First one is initial allowance. The second one is annual allowance. Initial allowance usually is 20% when you first acquire the qualifying plan for business use and the asset is new. Okay, Then only you can claim for initial allowance. For annual allowance is the... Um, uh, annual deduction, I would say, annual deduction of the on the cost and the, for the type of the asset. 
Okay, you, you inquire. And it is usually a strict line basic. And um, I'm not going to talk about the relevant section as you can uh, refer to the act if you have time. Basically, when you can claim initial allowance and annual allowance, you, you must be the asset owner, okay, by the end of the basic period for both uh, initial allowance and annual allowance. The owner, okay, the owner is a bit tricky. You may not have the legal ownership, but in case if you can prove to the authority you actually incur the qualifying capital expenditure and you pay for it, basically you can claim for both allowance, okay? Which means even uh, the asset, when, when you receive um, the asset is from your related company, because the invoice basically is address your related company, but you pay for the asset, then you can still enjoy or entitle for capital allowance. Let's move on. These are basically the um, annual rate uh, for capital allowance. As you can see, initial allowance usually 20%, but annual allowance will be go according to the category of uh, plant and machinery, as you can see from here. Okay. Of course, there are some asset or capital expenditure. You can only claim annual allowance. So it will depend on the type of asset. But in normal circumstances, these are the um, uh, asset you can see commonly, okay? I move on. So when we prepare the capital, uh, calculate the capital allowance, usually we will set up against with our adjusted income, as you can see from here. How we get the adjusted income when we start with a uh, net profit before tax, we add back those uh, disallowable items. We uh, uh, disregard those um, other income and other um, adjustment which we need to do. Then only we will take in the capital allowance. Usually for balancing charge, we have to add back and means add, add into the adjusted income. Then we less the capital allowance. Capital allowance, including an absorbed capital allowance, current year a capital allowance, and also the balancing allowance, okay? One thing we need to take note for capital allowance, they usually only can um, deduct again the same business source, which means if one company, you have 10 business source, you cannot set off against with one of the profit-making business, even uh, the respective business, um, like for example, source one is loss-making, so you cannot utilize the capital allowance, but source two is basically profit making. Then, uh, but the capital allowance for this business is insufficient. You cannot use the capital allowance from source one to set up against uh, the profit from source two. These are the meaning behind. Okay, so this is top, uh, this is so called the same business source. Okay, and when um, there are certain cases the capital allowance may be disregarded. When this company is a dormant company, please take note, when this company is a dormant company, you still have some unutilized capital allowance. It may be disregarded if they say there is a substantial change in shareholders, usually more than 50% of change. So, but this rule is not applicable or not applied to active company, which means if this company is the dormant company, Whenever you change the shareholding, you need to check whether you have any unutilized capital allowance. If the CA is very huge, so it is not advisable to change the shareholders until maybe you reactive the company, then uh, or you need to do some planning before you transfer the share. Okay, otherwise it will be become um a, a permanent loss for the company because it will be disregarded. Okay, uh, let's move on. As you can see from here, residue expenditure, if some uh, practitioner also call them tax return down value. Okay, how we calculate uh, this residue expenditure, uh, maybe let me show you this summary. It will be more easy for you to understand. Usually when we start with our cost, we minus our initial allowance, our annual allowance, and also notional allowance, then we will get residual 
expenditure or tax return down value. Notional allowance basically is when the asset is not put in use, then we have to claim notional allowance for that particular year of assessment, which means let's say this asset has been put in use for two years, but when come to third year, the asset is not put in use, we will claim notional allowance, there is nothing to claim. But the capital allowance still have to compute because the asset already start to claim the capital allowance way back to two years ago. These are the meaning behind. Okay. Let's move on. As you can see from here, this is the example uh, to show you how you calculate and get the residual expenditure. Um, like this, um, we start with qualifying expenditure, 20,000 minus initial allowance and annual allowance, then we will get our residual expenditure. Okay. And when the asset, like I mentioned, is temporarily not put in use, most likely you have to claim a uh, notional allowance unless you can prove that uh, this is temporarily not put in use. Um, of course, there are uh, some gray area of, uh, when we're talking about temporarily disused for the asset, which uh, I think I'm not going to talk about it in detail, not to compute use. Okay. Okay. You can see from here for qualifying cap expenditure, there are a few categories we have to take note. Uh, first one, the machinery or plant used in business. These are quite common. Okay. When we talk about plant machinery, usually we can claim. But when we talk about alteration of an existing building for installation of plant or machinery, this is a bit tricky. Okay. Because when we uh, brought in a uh, certain plant and machinery, certain plant and machinery we cannot use immediately when you um, purchase from the supplier. And what you need to do is you need to modify or you need to alter the current, uh, maybe your factory in order to install the plant machinery because certain machinery, uh, especially the heavy machinery, can, they can be quite huge. And you need certain platform, okay? to support the machinery before you put them in use, okay? And you need to consider when you prepare, uh, when you do some tunneling or leveling land in order to prepare a site for the installation of plant machinery, the cost itself, um, you need to consider about it. Why I say so is um, there, there is a restriction about the cost for you to prepare or install the plant machinery. Uh, I, I can give you an example with, later, but you just have to take note, it cannot be more than 10% of the total cost, which means the plant machinery and the installation cost, it cannot be more than 10%. Okay. And other than this, uh, you can also claim uh, capital allowance on fish pond, animal pens, chicken house, and so on. Okay. Um, in the past, in fact, when we talk about plant and machinery, the definition of plant machinery is not in the income tax act in those days. Okay, so usually we have to refer back to uh, case law. We have to look at the characteristic of the machinery, whether they have a uh, moving parts or not. Because if, let's say this is a permanent structure, then most likely we cannot claim capital allowance. And the most important is when we consider whether this is eligible for capital loan purpose, we have to uh, con uh, carry out certain tasks, okay? The, especially the main two tasks, functional tasks and also the premises tasks. And how we know uh, whether this qualify, uh, I mean, this expenditure can be function independently, then we have to check the function itself. Like for example, you can see from here, this are uh, Austra Max and Dram Berhard provide floor mat renting services. Okay. At the same time, of course, they will receive the rental uh, from the client for the rental of floor mat and also the cleaning of floor mat. The lifespan of floor mat is between three to five years. Okay. And the rental sum is based on the agreement in the contract. In this case, the floor mat can be functioned as a tool because this is the some sort like the um, plant 
you use to rent it out to the customer and earn the income. So this floor mat is a plan and eligible for capital allowance. Please take note also because the lifespan usually also another uh, consider, uh, criteria we need to consider before we claim capital allowance. Usually if the lifespan is less than two years, then most likely we cannot claim. Okay? In this case, the lifespan is more than two years. Let's move on to another uh, example. Now, when we talk about premise test, okay, the plant or machinery we bring in to, into our business, it cannot be only function as a premise. Okay, why I say so? Let's take a look on this example. Chilga Sundram Berhad, they actually is renting indoor football field. Okay, they uh, incur expenses on artificial glass on the field. And the company claim capital allowance in respect of the artificial glass. But unfortunately, when we see carefully and we talk through, this uh, artificial glass is not regarded as a plant. Okay, because um this indoor football field is just like a premise. It's not like the other one, they have a special function, it's movable. But for this uh artificial glass is Basically, it's non movable It just put on the floor and function as a premise for uh, uh, the, the client to come in and play indoor football. Okay, so in this case, uh, the function test, they fill the function test, but they uh, pass the premise test. So you cannot claim capital allowance on it. Let's move on. Okay. When we are, uh, this is go back to the um, alteration of its existing building for install the machinery or plant, which I think it will be better for me uh, to show you the example. As you can see from here, the cost of the machine is 500,000, okay, about half a million. In order to prevent the loud noise of an engine being heard on another floor, the existing building, they need to modify it, okay? They need to improve a soundproof wall and the alteration cost is about 150,000. The cost of the machine, 500,000 and the alteration cost, 150,000, they are qualifying expenditure, okay? Because we, we, they need to do that in order to put in place the machinery for the business purpose and this is uh, uh, the expenditure which I just now have mentioned about it to talk about uh, preparing, cutting, tunneling or raveling land in order to prepare a site for the installation of that machinery or plant. Let's take a look at the example here. As you can see from here, uh, this company basically installed an egg whisking machine, okay, costing about 150000 in a brick and cake factory. And they need to prepare the site for the machine and the cost of preparing the site is, was 10,000 in scenario one, 20,000 in scenario two. Why we put in two scenario? Because you remember just now I, I uh, already highlighted, 10% rules kick in in this case. The cost itself is 150,000 and the cost of preparing is 10,000 versus 20,000. When we check the 10% rule, we need to refer back to the aggregate cost. As you can see under the scenario one, 10% of aggregate cost is 16,000. So for 10,000 incurred under scenario one, you can uh, this company is eligible to claim capital allowance for the cost to, in, um, to prepare the site for the machine. But for scenario two, we cannot claim the, for the 20,000 because the cost, uh, aggregate cost for both a machine and the preparing site is more than 10%. Okay, under the scenario two, the 10% uh, is only 17,000. So 20,000 is more than the 10% rule. Then what you can claim is only 150,000. Okay. Uh, this basically is talking about uh, the, the answer uh, I have mentioned just now. 
Let's move on. Uh, this basically I have mentioned before, you can also claim capital allowance on fish pond, animal pens, chicken house, and so on. And okay. This is the one of the examples uh, given a company pairing on a, an activity of inland fishing that spent 45000 to purchase a pump okay, for mixing fish medicine and water purification. And this is the cost. This cost is 45000 This um, pump is basically a qualifying expenditure for this uh, inland fishing business okay but if let's say i today i am carrying a trading activity and i bought a pump for mixing fish medicine just for my own aquarium uh in the shop then you may not able to claim the 45000 okay it will still go back to um the uh, the situation whether this is for your business purpose or not because the if let's say you have an aquarium in your shop, these are basically for decoration purpose. Okay, it's not for you or not necessary for you to produce your income, your business income. Let's move on. Remember, I just now I mentioned uh, there are some years. Uh, in fact, uh, prior to YA Year Assessment Twenty Twenty One, there is no definition of plan under the Income Tax Act. Okay, we usually have to refer back to uh, the uh, case law or any example or any um, text, uh, I, I mean the, the uh, cases concluded by uh, tax authority before, then we learn from that, we take it as a precedent case for us to claim capital allowance. So way back to YA 2021, the first in announced there is a paragraph 70 capital A under schedule 3 be part of the Income Tax Act, which means they have defined plan under the Income Tax Act and is included under the schedule 3 okay, of Income Tax Act. They mentioned about plan means uh, apparatus used by a person for carrying on his business. Okay, but it does not including building intangible asset or other assets used and function as play between which a business is carried on. So, which means that they exclude building because for building, basically you can claim industry building if you can meet the criteria and you also cannot claim intangible asset like for example, software. Okay, these are the uh, definition when they uh, newly announced way back to 2021, but in 2023, that basically have changed or uh, make uh, minor changes on the definition of plant. They have removed the intangible asset, okay, in the act, which means from 2023 onwards, you can claim intangible asset as a uh, part of the plant for capital allowance purposes, okay? I move on. Okay, when we talk about capital allowance, there are also something we, also, we need to take note, especially for motor vehicle. Why we mention about motor vehicles specifically is because most of the time motor vehicles, they are under higher purchase arrangement, okay? When for motor vehicles, when we uh when we know that this is a commercial vehicle, like for example, bus, taxi, lorry, van, then there is no restriction on the qualifying expenditure. But for the normal passenger vehicle, then you have to apply certain rules. If the cost is less than hundred and fifty thousand, you can claim up to hundred thousand. But the cost is more than hundred and fifty thousand, you can only claim up to fifty thousand. These are 50,000 rules also apply to secondhand passenger vehicle. How we differentiate the commercial vehicle, um, just uh, to let you know, this is uh, uh, the, the uh, general knowledge. When you look at a van, if normal van, there is no um, something like uh, the, the van, they will write down the company name, it will receive it to how many passengers and so on. 
on the van itself. If the normal van, if they don't mention about this, this is usually not the commercial vehicle. Because commercial vehicle, you need to apply from the authority to get the special license. Okay. Let's move on. Okay. When we talk about qualifying expenditure for vehicle, okay, then uh, we can only include cash price, the basic accessory, and also the registration fee. Uh, if the cost like you incur for road tax, insurance, higher purchase interest, including the price for uh, to tender some of the special number are not included, uh, in, which means you are not applicable for qualifying expenditure of a motor vehicle purpose. Okay, which means when we call, claim capital allowance, you can only claim the first three. And this as a uh, cost, even though they are related to the vehicle itself, you cannot claim for it. You can either only claim um, revenue expenditure, which means you claim as a normal expenses, or uh, let's say like this reserve price for vehicle registration number, basically we cannot claim because this is uh, initial expenditure for the vehicle itself. Okay, let's move on. Uh, I think I have mentioned about this. I'm not going to talk about detail. Okay, let's move on to um, the uh, asset which we use for non-business before, which means you use for your um, private uh, expenditure as a private expenditure in the past. Now you want to bring it in to, for your business purpose. For example, uh, today I'm a sole provider. I actually have a private car. Then uh, this private car has been put in use for two years. Now I decided I want to bring it uh, into my business for business purpose. I need to identify the market value of the motor vehicle or machinery. Then I can compute the, uh, the, the capital allowance on it. Of course, it, because this is a used car, then I cannot claim initial allowance. I can only claim annual allowance. Okay, these are the one of the examples. Okay, I move on. Okay. Let's take a look on this example. This is quite similar uh, with what I have mentioned. Just now I mentioned about vehicle, and this is meant, uh, the example given is on computer. This uh, taxpayer bought a computer 5,000 in 2022 for his personal use at home. But in 2014, he decided want to uh, use for his sole provider business. As you can see from here, Okay, he bought 5,000, but today the market value is only 3,000. Then you can only claim 3,000. Calculate the annual allowance, not initial allowance, because this is not a, a new asset. A new asset. Then uh, you minus the annual allowance, you will get the residual expenditure. Okay, this is how we, we compute if for those uh, assets which we have used for personal uh before okay i move on and this uh is a bit different is more applied to uh an asset let's say they are hash between hq and also the branches okay especially for those outside malaysia let's say today uh i'm uh, uh my hq is in all uh, malaysia but i have a branch in overseas when I want to bring back certain asset from overseas to use in Malaysia HQ, then I need to know or identify the market value or even the netbook value of the machinery, whichever is lower on the date of machinery or plant uh, brought into use in Malaysia. Okay. okay. Let's take a look on this example. This company basically HQ in Perth, Australia. In 2014, two machines in Perth were transferred and used for the business in branches in Malaysia. So how to prepare and claim the capital allowance is you need to know where, uh, what is the market value to compare with the net book value. So in this case, although the market value is 900,000, but the net book value is 600,000, 
we will apply 600,000 for uh, computation of capital allowance purpose. And other than what I have mentioned, um, we also need to take note whether there is any cost when we incur as part of the installation cost for plant and machinery. Because for certain plant and machinery, especially for those we purchase from overseas, we may need certain uh, experts to come into Malaysia and carry out the installation and make sure the machinery can be used. Okay, what? Uh, they need to do is uh, when these experts come to Malaysia, they, the cost attributable to the installation on the uh, for this particular machinery, they need to determine it. Which means, let's say um, they may have some cost, like for example, 100,000. Okay, this expert may need to do some preparation work in overseas before they come into Malaysia. Maybe they will just stay in Malaysia for about a week. Then um, they need to uh, let us know how much the uh, cost they attributable out of the 100,000 to perform their services in Malaysia. Then let's say the cost itself is about 50,000. From this 50,000 will subject to withholding tax. So in order for us to claim capital allowance on the cost incurred, we need to pay the withholding tax. If no withholding tax has been deducted, basically you are not allowed to claim this cost for capital allowance purpose. Okay. Uh, let's move on. These are the example, uh, like just now I have mentioned. Okay. This uh, taxpayer basically incur a cost of 500,000, half a million for a, a two units of welding machine. Okay, then uh, an add, additional sum of 125,000 paid to Bristol Remitted from OSC to install and handling the welding machine in Malaysia. So what they need to do is they basically have to remit the withholding tax, okay, of uh, 12,500 to the tax authority in order for them to claim the capital allowance. Okay. Um, I move on. When we talk about uh, the some of the costs for dismantling and removing asset, uh, it is only applicable for plant and machinery. It, let's say this is under a written law or agreement. Um, this is a bit tricky, which uh, I will highlight, but I'm not going to share with you in detail because the competition itself is a bit different. Of course, for foreign exchange different, we also need to take note because the gain or loss of foreign exchange, it will either increase the value of the um, capital uh, qualifying expenditure or reduce the value of the um, qualifying expenditure. If this is a gain, of course, it will reduce the value. If that is a loss, we may need to incur more costs in order to bring this machine in into Malaysia. Okay. This is uh, talk about higher purchase. When we claim a uh, capital allowance under a higher purchase agreement, then we have to take note. Only the capital portion we can claim, okay? But not all the whole installment payment because the, the full installment payment may include the higher purchase interest. And higher purchase interest, you can claim as a revenue expenditure, which means you just claim it as a normal expenses. Okay. Let's move on, uh, which I think uh, for those assets with, if let's say the lifespan less than two years, you can either claim normal uh, ex as a normal expenses or as a replacement basic, which means like, for example, fork and spoon for um, restaurant, because you can easily misplace it and the lifespan for certain like uh, fork and spoon, the lifespan may be less than two years then you can only claim as a replacement basics, okay? But not capital allowance. When we talk about disposal, we also need to take note because most of the time when we dispose of an asset, we have to know what is their market value. Like for example, let's say today, this uh, company would like to um, dispose a motor vehicle to their director. They cannot just simply 
uh, dispose at uh, one ringgit because we, when we even though they dispose off at one ringgit to the director for tax purpose we will find out the market value of the motor vehicle and calculate the balancing allowance or balancing charge accordingly. Okay. Let's move on. Um, when we talk about balancing allowance and balancing charge, let me show you the example. Okay. Um, okay. I think this is more uh, talking about the relevant session when we want to calculate balancing allowance or balancing charge. When this RE more than disposal value, okay, then we can claim balancing allowance. Balancing allowance basically is a deduction, which it will be part of the capital allowance to set up against the adjusted income of the business. But let's say uh, the what we can get is the other way around, which means disposal value more than residual expenditure, a balancing charge is made. Okay, and what we need to do is we need to add back this balancing charge, which means it will be subject to tax for the amount, uh, additional amounts more than the residual expenditure. Of course, um, there are some restriction. When we count, when we get balancing allowance, okay, it's usually deduct against adjusted income. But please take note: usually, if let's say the balancing allowance amount is very significant, the tax authority may challenge you. You need to provide your commercial reason why you need to dispose of the uh, more, uh, the qualifying expenditure within certain period, especially for those within two years. In another case, let's say this is when we calculate, we get balancing charge, it will only be restricted to actual allowance we previously claimed before. Which means, let's say, what I have claimed before is 3,000, but the balancing charge I can get is 5,000. It will only risk to 3,000. This is the meaning behind. Okay. As you can see from here, today the residual expenditure is 70,000. Okay. And I dispose of in 2019. And I can get 50,000. But what I have claimed before is only 30,000. So what I need to do is only the 30,000 will be subject to tax, but not the whole 50,000, okay? Because I only claim up to 30,000 before. As I move on, these are the, I think it's the final part. When we talk about disposal, there are certain special circumstances which we also need to take note is about control sale. Why is so-called control sale is uh, this is more towards uh, the related party transaction. For example, today I have two company. Okay, I'm the magic shareholder for these two company and I control these two company. Although from shareholding, I this is not um uh I I I don't uh appear as a relationship between uh the shareholding between these two company, but basically I'm the person who control it. Whether this is considered as a control sale, let's take an uh, take a look, take a look on the definition. Control means the power of person to conduct the affair of the company in accordance with the sole discretion by way of shareholding, voting power, the power conferred by the article or association. <laughs> Sorry. So just now what I have mentioned one, it may not fall under control sale. Why I say so, you can see from here, the definition of the powers is by way of shareholding voting power, which means it must be I'm holding certain share and uh, the I, I need to show that there are some relations, like for example, this company is a um, holding company and this company is subsidiary company and both company have some shareholding and I can control them uh, in both company, then only this is considered control sale. So, it may not be so straightforward from uh, just the wording itself is control sale. It must be show that uh, they have some shareholding relationship, okay? And why we mention about control sale? Because if let's say this is under control transfer or control sale, there is no balancing charge or balancing allowance. 
calculated, we will def we will basically ignore the calculation of BA or BC. Okay. And this is the definition of a uh, power uh, control, uh, sorry, control definition under the act itself. As you can see, it must be able to prove that inquirer of the asset control over disposal or the other way around, or some other person has control over the disposal or acquirer. And they must be affected in consequence of a scheme or reconstruction. And also there will be a way uh, by way of a settlement or gift. Okay, all this they must fit in order to fall under the control sale. Okay. Uh, okay. What um the this uh the disposer need to take note is when they dispose uh the asset to the acquirer under the control sale, they need to inform how much capital allowance they have claimed before and the residue expenditure value so that the acquirer can continue to claim based on the residual expenditure value, okay, but not as a new asset. And this is talking about the assets owned for less than two years under the para uh, 71 of Schedule 3. Basically, if let's say uh, an asset, uh, a capital allowance can be called back, let's say the asset is sold within two years, but in reality, this is only applied if this is a luxury item because if let's say you can uh, justify with your commercial reason, like for example, um, the computer has been stolen or actually the computer, the motherboard has been crashed, uh, it cannot be used anymore, then you can still um, claim the capital allowance, uh, but not to crawl back, okay? not to call back the capital allowance, which has been claimed for the past two years. Okay, this is um, the, like for example, this computer was found 40 after six month usage, which means you cannot be used anymore. Then we calculate the uh, balancing allowance or balancing charge. And this is the balancing allowance we, uh, we claim after we compute uh, the, uh, we take into consideration the qualifying expenditure and also the sales proceed. Okay, 800, we can claim as part of the capital allowance because this is really cannot be used due to the commercial reason. And I think that's all for me for today's session. Thank you, Doctor. Thanks a lot for such a nice session. Um, yeah. I recall some of my memory of taxation while doing <laughs> the accountancy. <laughs> it gave me a kind of a like, uh, especially the qualified because our students understand, okay, this is the tax rate and this is what we need to apply. And they have a little bit of understanding about the deferred taxation. But when you actually pay for tax and how much is left over, how much you can reduce, what is the qualifying asset for that? This is something new, I think, for that. Yes. So I really appreciate, I really appreciate how you say in Chinese, sia, sia, for your <laughs> no problem. It's such a such a nice session. Now, um, if students have a question, they are feel free to write down in the chat box. Um, meanwhile, our student will think about having a question. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, the representation from MICPA. Uh, we have a Clement over here who will give some briefing about the MICPA and the career path. Also, uh, just a one more note to MICP is that on this 12, on this Friday, we are having a virtual town hall. We will discuss about the student getting exemption, use the route of MICP and how they can be in the part of, uh, how they become a member in, in MICPA after the qualification of bachelor. So in on 12th of uh, May, we have organized this uh, session, which we call uh, virtual town hall. So, over to you, Clement. Oh, I think we can finish up with questions for, for Dr. Woon first. I don't want to keep her waiting. <laughs> so, uh, uh, dear okay. students, do you have any questions you can ask her? Uh, yeah, okay. there's, there's a question Here's already. a question. Which aspect of the world do you enjoy the most? Uh, which aspect of the world? In fact, because uh, I'm a, an uh, extra person, I quite like to talk. Um, basically, uh, I quite enjoy when I talk to my client, I even talk to all the students, 
and even some of the association member, those are the thing I enjoy the most. When we talk about paperwork, um, of course, I still have to go through during my younger day uh, because uh, those days when I uh, just have to focus to review my, the file, um, although it's a bit boring for me, but I'm still enjoy because I every day I learn new things because every client give me different type of uh, problems, especially those uh, uh, specifically for their industry. When I know a uh, certain special thing or special problem about certain industry, I always feel that uh, today I earn something. This is how I make myself uh, to continue in tax industry and I continue to have the passion in this industry. Yeah. Good. Okay, I think there's on. one more question, is it? There is a, uh, oh, there's a student actually, she, I think she directly messaged me. I That's did. effective mm. for current YA, company can now claim CA on software. If a company is eligible for CA on software, what rate will be applicable? To be honest, they can claim uh, 2080 which means it's an accelerated capital allowance because software itself, uh, uh, our Malaysia government quite encourage the taxpayer to invest in that. Yeah, that tell our digital equipment. So usually you can claim 20% as annual allowance and 80%, uh, sorry, 20% for initial allowance and 80% for annual allowance. Okay. Uh, one question from my side. Uh, since you have been in academics and you are in the industry, um, and I can understand somebody say uh, she or he is a PhD, so it means she or he spent a significant amount of time in doing research. So how much that research is really applicable to your practical field? Um, maybe I can share with you my thesis topic. I basically focus in audit and investigation, which I also doing at the moment. So um, I feel actually um, up to certain extent, uh, I can apply for it because as uh, my PhD degree, I basically research, uh, the research is more uh, towards the negotiation skill of ah, an investigation. Okay. Yes. So any... I look at it, it's quite useful because I got mm. the chance to interview um, 15 or, uh, IRB officers. I managed to talk to them, talk to their head, and actually how they conducted the audit and investigation. What is uh, any uh, some secret they can share with me? That that is the privilege as a student, you know. If, uh, if let's say today I go I, after them and ask them about this question, they may not answer me because they know I'm a practitioner. Mm, exactly. Yeah. But as a student, you have that uh, luxury to ask them. You are right. You are right. <laughs> nice. Uh, do you have any uh, recent paper that you have published or uh, any research work you are doing on? Please, uh, uh, in do fact, I think my um, uh, my research just published uh, maybe a few months ago only. Uh, in, mm. I could share with you if you want. Yep. Yeah, I please do. Share with you. Um, yep. After this session, please share your paper. I love to read yeah. it. Uh, because when uh, industrial paper, pub, industrial person publish something, it's it's a lot of contribution towards the paper. It's not just the theory or some of the empirical words. It's more about the contribution of the paper. Because yeah. you guys been to the real life scenario. So I really love to read that one. Please do share your paper after this. No problem, no problem. I probably uh, share with Kremen, then Kremen will forward to you. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. okay. I, think I think just uh, nice. Three o'clock. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's no that's right on time. Yeah. No person coming in. Uh, yeah. Doctor, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for coming. Yeah. We students do stay so back. Students do stay back. Thank you so much, Doctor Wood, for Thank your time. You. I think it was really insightful. I I personally also enjoyed you know a few things that you shared. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you so much. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Take care. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. 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 Okay, guys. So oh. there's some briefing by MICTA. Over to you, Clem. All right. Thank you, Dr. Kakan. And dear students, thank you so much. It has been one hour. Uh, you guys are great. <laughs> I can see the numbers almost all of you are <laughs> sitting there. 
Okay, yeah. I won't take much time. Okay, maybe 15 minutes or so. Okay, let me quickly share my slide. Meanwhile, you are sharing your slide. Guys, uh, the attendance code for the forum on 1st May, uh, 8th May today, and the next week will be the 15th May, where we have a uh, uh, revision of the semester. I'm sharing this all with you. So keep it with for your international student can mark your attendance using this code. So check the chat. If you cannot apply this code, do let me know. All right. Uh, can you guys see the slide? Yes, we can. Okay, let, let's just let me just play a one minute video of Mikpa Khan's qualification. Let's start off with a video. So we have been watching uh, people talking. Let's uh, refreshing. A video can be refreshing. <laughs> be ready to be every business's remedy. To play the role of advisor, not calculator. To have every prediction and world event work in your favor. Be ready to make a difference. Ready to be visionary, to charter your impact on every community. Tip societal skills with skills that give people more power than protest barriers. Be ready to go the distance. Ready to be the most valuable asset, to see technology as opportunity and make innovations work for you, not replace you. Be ready to be irreplaceable ready to evolve in the real world as a professional accountant that leads the front lines of whatever comes next. Mick Pacan's qualifying program. Be ready for real. All right. Okay. Um, can I ask you if you're all, uh, are they all final year students? Yes, they are. Yeah, finally, students. Okay, fine. First of all, good news is you guys are all on the right track choosing accountancy, right? Okay, so you know what? I always tell students, um, accountancy is always doubted to be either recession-proof or even recession or rather recession-resilient um, profession compared with many other professionals. I mean, many other qualifications. Uh, careers out there, professions out there, right? So that's good news. Um, what we will cover today briefly, so I'll go very quickly, okay, since we don't have much time left for accounting profession, uh, who is MIGPA, okay, introduction to the program, why the MIGPA cans, all right, the structure a bit and the benefits of becoming a MIGPA. Okay, in the first place, why an accounting career? So I believe all of you would have thought about it even before deciding to start off your accounting degree, I believe so. So definitely stability of the job that it gives, right? So as I said, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's like almost like a recession-proof profession, okay? And then it's rewarding. So I'm sure you know it's uh, a professional accountants, those in this field, uh, one of the top money earners in the world. Global career opportunity, all right? So you can, nowadays, I, I more and more hear kids, you know, they say they, they may not be working locally, they would go to Singapore, they go to Australia, they go anywhere in the world, all right? So when you have a qualification like this, it's like, you can spread your wings, you go anywhere. And we need more and more accounts. It's not only in Malaysia, you know, we have a shortage worldwide. There are always jobs for you, okay? So where do accountants work? So you can see public practice, public sector, own business. You can see, you know, when you, when you have this knowledge, you can run A to Z your business yourself. Top management, if you see in all the C-suite um, professionals, right? You see most of the CEOs, you will find if you dig their background, you can see that they have accounting qualification. I think companies love to hire, they want to have their CEO, um, with, with accounting background because you see it's very important, right? So you will be making important decisions, financial decisions for your company. So it's important that they are 
you know, on the top of the game, you know, they, they know the stuff, all right? So operational roles, management controls, stakeholder communications, you can find out a lot more. You just Google what you can do with your accounting qualification. Since uh, Once an accountant is just, you know, not just sitting in the office, doing the normal thing that you hear people doing, there are a lot more exciting things that you can do. And this is bad. We don't have, especially in Malaysia, we don't have enough accountants. You know, sometimes bad news, you just look at the silver lining in the cloud, the darkest cloud. That means more opportunities for you guys. So as I say just now, it's a good profession. So you all are on the right track. Okay, about MIGPA. All right, so we were established in 1958, all right? And then we are also a member of IFAC, founding member of IFAC since 1977. Okay, as all, I believe most of you would know, MIGPA is the only national professional accounting qualification, okay? That doesn't mean that it's not recognized globally. We have global recognition. You see, we are a member of IFAC. If you know IFAC, it's International Federation of Accountants. They are like, uh, you know, they are the voice for the professional, uh, the profession, the accounting profession, okay? They have more than 3 million um, members. And what they do is that they support um, the development, the implementation, the adoption of financial uh, uh, accounting standards, accounting standards among others, okay? So uh, IFAC says that, you know, if, if this a particular body like MIGPA, you know, if uh, if this if, if a body is part of an accounting pro professional body part of IFAC, that means uh, they are of high quality. All right, so which means the qualification that we offer is of uh, relevance, of is of credibility, capacity. All right. Okay, so we represent Malaysian accountants in dialogues with regulators. So this is very important. All right, CB as the local professional accountancy body. So we have, uh, we are always in constant consultation with a lot of regulatory bodies in Malaysia, like LSD and security commissions and whatnot. So we have the latest information. And what we do, we would provide them. So you get first hand information. Okay, information getting fast enough is key in today's digital world, right? And then since 2009, we are working with CANS. All right, so those of you who want to work in Australia, you know, CAN is a, a premier qualification in Australia. So you do MIGPA, you get MIGPA CAN's dual qualifications. All right. Okay, let me just go quickly go through, you know, some students, they have this question of what is MIGPA? What is the difference between MIA and MIGPA? Okay, MIA is the regulatory body in Malaysia. Okay, they regulate they monitor and regulate uh, accountants in Malaysia. You know, every country, they will have their own regulatory body in Malaysia. It is MIA. Let's look at some of the differences. Okay, one is, you know, the Accountants Act. I was incorporated in 1958. And then they are regulator. We are a professional body. Membership title, you get CAM. And then professional title uh, from MIGPA, you get uh, certified professional accountant M. Okay, recognized in Malaysia, MIGPA is internationally recognized. Okay, why I'm saying there's no way, you know, to say that, oh, MIA is not it's only in Malaysia, MIGPA Malaysia is internationally recognized. No, no, nothing is so. What I'm trying to say is that under uh, Schedule 1, okay, there is Part 1, Part 2. Part 1, if you qualify from uh, accounting degrees from certain uh, universities, especially like uh, public universities and some other university. From that route onwards, you get some experience, you register with MIA, you call yourself chartered accountant. The word chartered accountant is licensed, okay? You can't call yourself an accountant unless you register with MIA. And then there is part two, where you go to professional qualification. So with once you complete your Monash degree, you need to go and do a professional qualification, all right? So that uh, with relevant experience, you become a MIGPA member, for example, then you register with MIA you become uh, an accountant, okay? All right, these are some of the success stories, you know, some of the students with the MIGPA um, and they're having exciting global careers. You see Monash is there, 
Martha Evelyn, all right, in UK. Okay, there are some highlights or highlight reasons I would say why NICPA hands. Okay, definitely, as I mentioned just now, global recognition, we are under IFAC body, so it's, there's no doubt about international recognition. Okay, access to Global Accounting Alliance, GAA. Okay, this is very interesting. Not many professional accountancy bodies part of this uh, GAA. Okay, there are about uh, 10 international professional accounting body in this group. Uh, I'll talk to you a more I, in the next slide. I think I have more details about this. Uh, let's go to the next one. Dual qualification. So you get dual qualification when you do this program. You see, make final for camps. Local contacts and relevance. So we offer Malaysia taxation. So as a local professional accountancy body, so you're going to learn, uh, you know, you're going to work at the end of the day, most of you in Malaysia, right? So you need to understand the local tax and regulation. Employment opportunities, we work with a wide range of employers, right? So uh, we have built the connections, the rapport relationship with employers, so we can easily connect you uh, in terms of training. So even in terms of like, we have a lot of scholarships available, so we can even connect you with them. Develop professionals with the right skill sets. Okay, you know, it's no longer about taking a professional qualification. Okay, last week I was in USM, I was talking to the student. You know, um, doing well academically is important. I believe your lecturers would always tell you that, you know, that's one component. There's another component that we students, you students, I mean, have to really focus on, which is the soft skills part, the transferable skills part, right? So our qualification is imbued, is embedded with all these things. So it's not only to develop your technical aspects, it's also about, you know, how to communicate, the leadership skills, you know, people, interpersonal skills, all these things which are very important, very crucial in nowadays world. Employees want to see all these developed the moment you join them, all right? Okay, this is the GAA I talked to you about. So you see there are 10 uh, professional bodies you can see on the screen, part of this uh, alliance. Okay, so what happens is that, so when you're part of uh, this alliance, so say that you go overseas, MIPA office is not that, so no worries about it. Because you just knock on the door of any of these professional bodies. You need some updates. You are there and you need to know some technical stuff updates, you want to go for some seminars and trainings and whatnot, you know, they would offer at, at, at members rate, for example. So they treat you as their own member and provide you whatever support assistance that they can. All right. So help is just one knock door, knock away, or you can call them or you can even drop them in. Okay, so this is about part ways. Okay, so since Monash degree is accredited MIGPA accredited degree. So you just look at the advanced stage examination. So basically there are two stages, right? Professional stage examination, then there's another one advanced stage examination. Professional stage, you are completely going to get exemption, right? So you just look at ACE, all right? So this is where you're going to start. Okay, so uh, I will take you in the next slide. I have more information on this. Then you you will have about you obtain about three years of experience. Okay, that's important. Mentored experience. Then you obtain your MIGPA membership. All right. So you can see the program structure. Okay. So what do you see here? I know there are quite a number of papers. Okay, don't be discouraged. I know students being students, even if I put myself in your shoes and you look at the papers, oh, there are many papers in MIGPA, but let me tell you, even though there are eight papers, they are divided into two, all right? Four are exam-based. And then you have another four, basically none exam, all right? It's coursework, group work. Uh, this is where you get to develop all your transferable skills. Okay, so basically it's just four. You just focus on the four papers, exams. And the good news is these four papers are all open book system. 
Okay, I'm sure you would not have had the experience of attempting open book system. All right, but I will tell you right from the school, then some of you may have taken diploma or some straight degree. So you have been trained with the closed book, right? Okay, it's good. But at a certain level, I would say that you need, you need a paradigm shift maybe, you know, how you approach, how you learn, okay? Uh, uh, when it comes to exams, it has to be open book because through the system, because we have revamped, because times have changed and Mikwa realized that, okay, at this stage, students need to deal with, we have to put students in real life situations, okay? No, they can't be memorizing all the time, you know? Even your hard disk would have become full by now, right? So much to cram in. So it has to be more about understanding. So when you understand, you can really deliver. So say that you start working, right? So you don't have to tack on the memory bank and try to get answers because it's going to flow seamlessly because you have understood everything from the beginning, all right? When you started your MIGPA. So that's what we want. We want to develop, we want to produce thinkers, people who can analyze, all right? So we want our graduates, our members to be different than the rest, okay? So that's about open book. And I can tell you that our passing marks are great, okay? In the past, it used to be very difficult. Mikpa used to be a very difficult qualification in the past many, many decades ago. But right now, if you compare with other professional qualifications out there, you can see Mikpa has one of the best passing rates. So what does it mean, okay? It means that it's easier, okay? Definitely, that translated into easier. Yes, but why is it easier? There's no compromise in quality. It's easier because we have comprehensive study resources in place, all right? And then as I mentioned just now, open book systems, you're going to understand. So it becomes easier when you attempt to answer your exams, okay? There's no more this situation where, oh my God, it's just there. I just can't get it. You know, you, you're memorized. It's there. You can't get it. And after exams are over and you look at your textbook, I knew this. It just didn't crop up. You know why it happens? Because you memorized. But that is not going to happen with open book. You know, you're going to, you're going to refer to your notes. Okay, you're going to refer to your notes, whatever we have is my capability to learn, you know, online notes, you can highlight and whatnot. So you're going to have all these handy because at the end of the day, you're not going to like pluck those notes and provide us answers. No, that's only going to serve as the guidance and you're going to come up with your own solutions, right? Okay, and the third one, okay, the first one, uh, the resources, the second, I said the open book systems. The third one would be our modules. You see, our modules are eight, right? So the depth and breadth will be manageable. Okay, you can digest because they are smaller modules. All right, rather than we give you four papers and all of those, like if you refer to the books, take books, how are you gonna do, how are you gonna manage, right? So smaller modules also contribute. Uh, you, you can uh, uh, understand well, Okay, when it comes to exams, you, you know, it makes it easier for you to attempt exams and do well. Three years work experience, I mentioned just now. So you go through mentor three years work experience. It has to be after you registered with MIGPA, okay? Because it has to be, we need someone qualified to monitor and make sure the experience is relevant. So it has to be guided experience. You can do full-time or part-time. We are very flexible, okay? Uh, there's no one size fit all okay different students have uh, different tastes different way of studying you know some students need all the time in the world to study some you think that you know if you work the experience what you go through is going to help when you attempt exams okay so you pick which you want so four exams four course work based which i mentioned just now Okay, I know time is running out. Uh, let me quickly mention about subjects which are technology related subjects. You look recent technology. So you see, we have revamped our subject data analytics and insights. Okay, financial modeling, and there's another one financial modeling, and then there is sustainability for accountants. Recent technology, you see, now it's all about digitalization, right? So 
we want our professionals to be able to handle all these. Okay, with technology comes risk. So we want our professional to be equipped with all the skills. You know how to mitigate risk. You know how to handle, you know, your client's data and all that. So um, they would know that it's in safe hands. You know, you know how to manage. Data analysis inside. So you, you always hear nowadays about big data and stuff like that, right? So as a MIGPA graduate, as a MIGPA member, you will know how to translate draw data into useful information so that your company can make important business decisions. So your role becomes very important. Financial modeling, I believe you know about this. You, when you have the right knowledge, uh, financial modeling capabilities is becoming uh, more and more important, okay? Um, very sought after, competence to see, competency see, competence, uh, right now, and uh, you will be able to forecast, or right, do the right forecasting for your business, success of your business. Sustainability, okay, you hear about ESG also all the times, okay? So nowadays companies are very concerned about their company, their activities, everything has to be ESG compliant. So you working for them, you are going to advise them on the right things, okay? You need to make sure that, uh, like, your, whatever they do, you know, how you manage your customers, how you manage your employees, okay? The community your company operates in, okay? The regulation, governance, and whatnot, everything we have to follow. So you will play an important advisory role to your company. Okay, program structure, you see here, as I mentioned just now, uh, exam based, uh, then you also we have course back, course work based 50 50. Okay, you see here the duration eight weeks, the longest year you can see tax, it takes about four, uh, 14 weeks, and then the shortest one will be ethics and business. This is the first one you, you only take about uh, two weeks. So, um, this is where you get to learn all your soft skills, get to develop them in. Okay, of course, you have already started so. There's more platform given to you to develop and work on all these skills. Okay, Alan Kwa is uh, uh, Monash alumnus. All right, so you see here what he says. I really enjoy the program so far. The subject, real world scenario. Okay, this is what I want to stress. Okay, it's about just I mentioned just now the open book and whatnot. It's all about the real world. It's not about theories anymore. Okay, it's about the practical stuff. And here you see these are some of our approved employers, group training uh, employers. So accounting firms, commerce and industry, some of them. So you become a MIGPA member. So what happens? Automatically qualify for CANS membership. So you can apply. High regard and recognition from the industry. Everybody knows about MIGPA, okay? Be a voice of Malaysian accountants. Global mobility. So it's like a passport in the qualification, the membership is so portable, you can take it anywhere. It speaks for you the minute they see you have Mipakan's qualification. They know you have, uh, you know, an unquestionable qualification, okay? That speaks for you. Technical updates, support, resources, there's plenty. Membership support, events and activities. Okay, one best part about having a professional qualification is that you never keep still. You continuously learn, upgrade yourself, all right? So this is something that employees love. CPD opportunities, continuous professional development. So build network, you will realize later, maybe some of you already started in the professional world, you will realize that building network is so important, okay? Be it for career progression, you shift jobs, learning, okay? Uh, keeping yourself abreast, you, you learn from others, you mingle the, the events that opportunities, such opportunities that we provide. Recognition from other bodies. Uh, we also have uh, young MIGPA, association club where you can part of it you you can uh contribute to others you know up students are there you are a student once you become a member you you are like an ambassador uh you start sharing knowledge all right inspire the next good the next generation okay because we need more accountants so you become uh nipa qualified you become an accountant and you need to tell the world that 
uh, everybody out there needs to take up this qualification, okay? Because we don't have enough. So in summary, um, okay. Uh, you have access to MIA membership, okay? Um, it's a most highly regarded qualification, the CAMS membership in Australia, New Zealand. These are all the key things. The GAA, you go on Google, you can find out more. Open book assessment. I talked about the assessment structure. Pass rates, excellent pass rate. Sponsorships available. Okay, please contact us. Okay, you scan this. Um, uh, and uh, you can find out more information. Okay, you can also uh, arrange any such. If you need to talk to us, uh, take this because today we didn't have much time. So I had to go super fast. So I'm sure there are a lot of things that I want to share. So contact me, contact us, so we can talk more. And uh, definitely you can drop me, um, my email is there. You can drop me any questions if you have. Okay, I think three minutes just in time. Uh, Dr. Kakan um, has a meeting to go, I believe. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. <laughs> Kakan. For, Thank you very much. Thank you very yeah. much. And uh, hey, guys, we have many events coming up on uh, MICPA, like uh, one more. Uh, that a virtual